In this Global 20 interview, I'm joined by Doug Gurr, Director of the Natural History Museum in London. We're looking today at the roles corporates can play in the philanthropic sector. And there's no one better than Doug to address this question, thanks to his experience in both the non-profit world and that of his corporate career, including his role at Amazon. So Doug, welcome. It's very nice to see you. Could you tell us about your journey from the corporate world to the non-profit world? Thanks, Ian. Good morning and hello, everybody. Yeah, I mean, in, in simple terms, I mean, my career was was pretty much straight down the line, day job commercial, you know, a stint in consulting, a stint doing a sort of dot-com startup, a chunk at Asda Walmart, and then nearly 10 years at Amazon, uh, China, the UK. So very much, you know, day job was commercial roles, working through all of those. Uh, but along the way, I'd always tried to, from quite early on, devote a certain amount of time to doing non-profit work. Uh, I'd always loved museums. So I think, you know, must be, gosh, over 20 years ago now, I, I got involved with the Science Museum, initially helping out on the commercial side. And then after a while, I was invited to become a trustee, eventually became chair there and chaired the British Art Foundation. So I'd always had to, and sat on the board of the National Gallery. So I'd always had, if you like, half a day, a day, a week devoted to trying to do the non-profit stuff. Uh, and I was I was very happy where I was at Amazon, but then um, as, as as things do, somebody sent me a, this job to come and be director of the National History Museum, and they said it's a bit left field, but what do you think? And I looked at it, and uh, and the museum had just written a new strategy, uh, and I read the strategy, and I thought that looks amazing and really hard. Uh, so I went to the board and I said, you know what? I know a little bit about museums and quite a lot about getting how how do you get stuff done? How about it? And that was really the transition. So two years ago now. You're on record saying that experience from the corporate sector is highly relevant in the philanthropic sector. Can you just expand on that for us a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to work for a number of sort of very well run commercial corporate organisations, a little bit with government, a little bit with non-profits. And, you know, different organisations tend to be tend to be good at the things they have to be good at. And, you know, from my perspective, from my experience, I would say well-run commercial organizations probably are partly because you have a sort of much simpler objective function you're trying to optimize for one thing you're up against competition they tend to just have become the best at, at getting stuff done if you like um so in terms of just have you built the mechanisms the audit processes the ability to scale i think you can learn an awful lot of that in in a well-run commercial organization um you know whereas you tend to find perhaps in the the public sector and non-profits you know they're a little bit better at juggling the question of multiple conflicting priorities and multiple stakeholders but if you just want to to take the basic ability to as i would put it get stuff done then i think there's probably no better no better grounding than spending time in the commercial world uh, and now turning to the natural history museum itself you described the state of the world in, in pretty stark terms could you share your thoughts on the current status quo and where we're at in this moment sure and um I mean, the, the the sort of honest answer is we're not we're not in a great place. I mean, you know, as you say, the subject uh, matter of the museum is planet Earth and life on planet Earth. Um, we know the planet's been around for about four point six billion years. That's four and a half thousand million years. Uh, we know life evolved about three point six billion years ago, so it's been around a long time. Uh, and for the first three billion, just in the oceans, then about five hundred million years ago, life emerged onto land. Um, and life has been incredibly successful. So it's spread to every corner of the oceans, every corner of the land. It's incredibly resilient. Uh, but we also know that over that enormous period of time, there have been a small number of occasions when almost all life has disappeared. And uh, we call these mass extinction events. So a significant change in environmental conditions has wiped out almost all life on Earth. And it's happened five times. That's just five times in the last 500 million years. So it's very infrequent. And the last one was a whole 66 million years ago when the asteroid came in and took out the last of the non-avian dinosaurs. So very, very rare infrequent events, but they do happen. And I think the challenge is, you know, every single piece of data we look at, whether it's telling us that we could be heading for a sixth mass extinction. And this time it would be the first time where that mass extinction is a direct consequence of human activity. So that's that's where we are. It's uh, it's not an unfixable problem. Crucially, this can be fixed, but it's it's not a problem we can ignore. And Doug, you've spoken in the past about the three axes of groups or or people who can be uh, influential in a positive way uh, in in this situation. How would you describe the corporate response to the crisis? 
Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. I mean, look, here at the museum, we've taken the view that, you know, what's, and as you could say, what inspired me to join the museum was a, a very brave decision, I think, by the by the board at the time and, and the team to say, look, we're, if you like, for years, we've been chronicling the decline of biodiversity. It's trying to try and fix it and to do something about it. And sort of we see our role, as we put it, as trying to create advocates for the planet. And that's about how do you inspire at scale people to care a bit about the natural world and to care enough to want to do something about it. Uh, and if you like, that starts from people, a mass audience. Uh, and we know people can achieve an enormous amount if they if they act in the right way and make those small incremental changes. But we also know if we really want to to solve this this this, this problem, uh, it's not enough just to sort of, if you like, pass responsibility to individuals. We need people to play their parts, we need corporates to play their part, and ultimately we need governments to play their part. There is something that only governments can do when they come together. Uh, but actually, for me, one of the biggest levers is, you know, we know that um, corporates are where, where things happen in the world. That's where stuff happens at scale. And, and some of that will be about satisfying the, if you like, the bottom up demand of, of people and customers. But a lot of it is just sort of, you know, helping. Um, we, we cannot solve this problem without looking at a lot of the large and medium sized and small corporations around the world, making sure that they're acting in such a way that we can, of course, still have a good level of economic growth. Uh, and of course, still have you know commercial success, but do it in such a way that doesn't overconsume the Earth's resources. And at the macro level, that's the risk we have. And you know, if you like wind back the clock a bit, you know, the assumptions always been that you know the planet's so big, how can it possibly matter? What does one individual corporation do? You know, the reality is we're now at a scale at which human activity absolutely has a planetary impact. And if you want a um, simple example of this, um, let's think about chickens. You know, chickens now outnumber all other birds on the planet by more than two to one. So the notion that human activity has no impact on a planetary scale is just long gone. Uh, and therefore, if we want to solve a planetary emergency, we have to get uh, the right engagement from corporates. And, and not, not to say it's not an either or, but how do we actually continue to be commercially successful, continue to provide customers with what they need? But as I say, do it in a way that doesn't overconsume the Earth's resources. And you paint the picture very clearly. But thinking about corporates, they often have competing priorities and boards wrestle with how to manage these. How do you think we can bring CEOs and boards into the discussion and how can they be comfortable that they have a role to play and they can actually make a difference? It, it's a great question, Ian. And, and in a sense, um, the danger of this debate, and I'm sure a lot of CEOs listening to thinking, are probably sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, yet another thing. You know, I just got my head around my ESG agenda, my carbon, my whatever. Now you want me to pile biodiversity on top of that. And if we if we if we turn it into just yet another thing, I think we're gonna have a real challenge because that becomes at best something a board has to manage. And you'll end up, if you're not careful, with a tick box exercise or a an absolute do minimum exercise. And unfortunately, that won't be enough. So, so to really make progress, it's back to that point about, look, we understand, you know, the power of a corporation is that you're trying to, you're trying to optimize, if you like, for a fairly singular metric, we're trying to create shareholder value over the long term. Um, so, so I think there's different ways you can do it. I think we can make a certain amount of progress, if you like, by saying, look, there'll be a regulator environment in which you have to operate. So there may be certain practices or certain locations, you know, COP15 suddenly says 30 by 30, you can't operate, you make some progress. I think to really make systemic progress here, though, we need to take, um, you know, if you, if the risk of being a bit nerdy at the moment, you know, what the economists would call an externality and internalize it. In other words, if we can crystallize um, properly in a way that just translates it to simple numbers, uh, the impact of a corporation's uh, activities on biodiversity, positive or negative, and we can begin to put some quantifiable value on that, then I think actually you're making life much simpler because all you're saying is you're still optimizing for shareholder value, but we're recognizing that a component of particularly long-term shareholder value is making sure that you're not either taking huge risks around your biodiversity exposure or possibly you're also taking opportunities to really get into those new markets. So for me, it's about... Um, it sounds a bit terrible. I'm a bit of a numbers geek. So how do we actually translate this into something that then it just becomes part of the day job? And all you've had to do is just tweak the way in which we sort of measure value. It sounds a lot easier to say than do, but um, but actually I think there's some, some other ways we can actually start doing that. But there's a core message there, isn't there, which is uh, trying to make the topic more accessible 
so that CEOs can share with their boards this whole area in a way that makes sense in the overall context of what the corporation is trying to do. Exactly so. And and I think, you know, in some ways, if you contrast, um, it's not a perfect analogy, but if you contrast where we are on climate and carbon and net zero, I think there's a, a really good level of understanding now. I think most boards have, have thought through the issues, understand the importance and increasingly are coming up with plans that will, will help you know, the energy transition. Biodiversity is much less well understood. Um, most boards I speak to, you know, you, you, you write almost, I mean, sounds terrible, you're almost back to the what is it, how do we measure it, why does it matter? You're almost back at that basic level. I'd say we're probably a decade or so behind in the level of corporate understanding. But if we can follow a similar path in which we make it simple enough, uh, easy enough, quantifiable and measurable, then I think we've got a reasonable chance of creating action. And as you know, a wise person once says, you know, you can't make it simple, you can't make it clear, and you can't make it clear, it can't be made to happen. So I think we really want to, in, in, uh, to engage corporates and actually get stuff done. We've got to turn it back into the right language that will make sense around a board table, that will make sense to the manager at the front line, the employee at the front line. Uh, and just make it really, really simple. Yeah, so so interesting. So so just t changing tack a little bit, just going into the detail a bit more on what the Natural History Museum has done itself in response to the crisis and areas where corporates might be able to engage with that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about current programmes that you're, you're thinking about at, at the museum? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Ian. So look, we've, we've spent... Um, you know, when I arrived here and having had the benefit of, if you like, sat in both the corporate world and the nonprofit world, I said, look, we're not, we've got no chance of engaging if we can't measure. And if we can't measure in a way which is simple and clear and granular. Um, and so we put a lot of energy into, and by the way, that's that's not a new problem. I mean, if you go right back 15, 16 years when the UN initially set out its sustainable development goals, uh, tried and failed to set goals for biodiversity because there was no way of measuring it. And people say it's too complex feels counterintuitive, you look out of the window, you know, you hear birds, you see trees, you sort of go problem, what problem? So I said, look, we've, we've got to find a way of measuring it. Uh, and then of course, one of the joys of the museum, uh, and by the way, people probably know us as that big visitor attraction in South Kensington, and we are, we love that. Uh, what people tend not to realize is this place is also a fairly serious scientific research institute. So there's 350 full-time academic scientists here. There's 172 PhD students all working on these questions of you know, biodiversity and life sciences. And how do we come up with solutions, as we would say, from nature for nature? Uh, so we've been thinking hard about this question of measurement. Uh, and there's a fantastic team here who have spent you know, well over 10 years grappling with this problem. Uh, and they've come up with a really simple um, but quite profound measure, which effectively looks at any part of the Earth's land surface and sort of says, um, how intact is it? What percentage of the pristine natural biodiversity still exists? And I won't bore you with the details, but behind it is an enormous amount of science and you know, 5 million proper reference data points so that for over 48,000 different types of ecosystem around the world, we can say, what is its pristine natural state against a, a massive taxonomic database? Uh, and then we can use effectively satellite imagery, land use data, and a bit of clever sort of um, machine learning geo applications to look at any square of the Earth's land surface and say, for that square, what percentage of the pristine natural biodiversity still exists? So if you if you have tropical rainforest in Brazil and you cut it down to plant soya to feed cattle in the US, that's pretty catastrophic for biodiversity and we can measure it. And so it'll give you a simple, single simple number. It's a percentage in all to 100. Uh, and you can apply it, it's global, it's granular, you can apply it at every scale, you can do the whole world, you can do a country. And crucially for a company, we can look at a corporate's uh, operations and its global footprints and just give you a percentage, you know, for where you're operating, where you're sourcing from, you know, what what is the sort of the biodiversity impact on that? Are you at 50, are you at 70, or 90? Uh, you can go back in time using historic data and crucially you can model forward based on changes to land use and climate. So you've got a simple granular measure. We've been working very hard to sort of, you know, drive adoption of that, both on the policy side, so that when we start talking about protecting 30% of the Earth's surface, we can sort of say definitively, well, which 30% is it most likely to protect? Uh, and we can start to engage with a corporation where it might say, look, you're, you're doing a fantastic job, but look, instead of sourcing from this location, you've been moving from this location to that location, 
you could uh, at worst have no detrimental impact or economic and your commercial performance, but you can make a massive difference to biodiversity. So that's where just trying to translate it to a simple metric, easy, comprehensible, global, granular, uh, and something people can relate to. So that's 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 a lot of the work we've been doing to try and you know, bluntly put simple, understandable numbers around this. And just staying on that theme then, and looking at engagement with the corporate sector, how have you worked with corporates in that area, and what has been the response? So we've we've um, spent probably, as I say, we did a lot of this. This work has been ten plus years in the gestation, but have been primarily, if you like, in the academic research arena. Uh, just under two years ago, we we introduced it to the policy arena. So, for example, ahead of COP twenty six in Glasgow. We put numbers for the whole world, every country in the world, every year back to 2000, every decade back to 1970, and projections forward. So we could begin to inform that policy debate. Um, most of our last, I'd say, 12, 15 months has been trying to, um, not trying to, has been engaging with the corporate world. Uh, I think the response has been you know, really positive. We've done a number of interesting case studies with corporations where we've been able to look at proposals and crucially be able to say, we can look at what you'll have today uh, what you're planning or would be willing to change. And we can tell you today how that will play out potentially 10, 15, 20 years forward. So you can start to quantify and begin to value these things in a way which makes sense. So that's um, that's been adopt, um, engagement at the individual corporate level. Uh, the other piece we've been working with, probably putting even more energy, I'd say, into in the last sort of six, nine months, certainly, has been talking to the investment community. Um, so when we talk to the investment community, Understandably, they're saying to us, look, we, we're, we're aware of the potential that, you know, if regulation comes in and certain areas become no go, you've got stranded asset risk, you've got opportunity risk, you've got transformational risk. Um, so actually, I think part of, part of helping corporates is helping them deal with their shareholders. Uh, and part of that is beginning to, if we can make an intervention at the, if you like, the financial reporting level, at which part of corporate reporting in a way in which people can trust and is consistent and works effectively globally, not just in one country. If we can be, begin to bring these kind of um, this data, these mechanisms in, I think you've got a chance to really sort of move the needle systemically. So that's where we've put it, been putting some energy. Um, and as I say, look, we're not remotely precious. We've got a metric out there. There are many competing metrics. Um, you know, if there was a better one, we'd absolutely be pushing that. So a lot of the feedback we get from people who've looked at all these in order to this, you know, we, we have the one which probably has two orders of magnitude more data points than anybody else is. It gives you that global granularity. So that's the one we're currently sort of trying to push and engage. Um, not quite done yet, but hopefully over the next reasonable period of time, we can start to get to the point where it just then becomes a lot easier for every corporation because it's simply part of the reporting structure. And if you like, you, as I said, you, you've taken something which, if we're not careful, becomes a side issue and translated into something which just becomes part of their job mainstream because it's just part of how corporations think about their, their overall performance. And as I said, it's the economists would say, if we've taken that externality and internalized it, and at that point, we know that it's will change. Well, that does all sound very encouraging. And uh, all being well again, this is a theme that boards can get their minds around and start to embrace as part of a solution going forward. But looking into the future, I mean, there's obviously a lot to, to be of concern. There's a lot to be worried about. Uh, and there are quite a number of interlocking themes that all need to be join, joined together. But looking at the overall picture, are, are you hopeful about the future? Absolutely. I mean, I think the I, I'm I'm actually I'd even got to be on thoughtful. I'm actually quite optimistic because this is a fixable problem. I mean, the if you like, um, Papa Dasgupta, uh, extraordinary economist, was commissioned a couple of years ago by the UK Treasury to really to really look into. Did a massive report, six hundred fifty odd pages on the economics of biodiversity. But the exam question was: Is it possible? to find a path in which we can still have a good level of global economic growth, which we have to have, without over-consuming the Earth's natural resources. That, if you like, is the exam question. Uh, and the good news, genuinely, is that the answer is yes. Um, it's quite a narrow path, uh, and it's not the path we're currently on. But that's why if we can just nudge everybody, people, corporations, governments, towards that path, we can absolutely still have good levels of economic growth, provide citizens around the world with the goods and services that they, that 
like well it's our kind of living standards but just do it in a way that doesn't over consume the earth's natural resources so the path is absolutely there uh i think the desire is there to get it and it's not and it's not facing citizens with completely unrealistic choices you know we're not saying never fly again go vegan but it is saying that if all at the margins people can make changes and we can just nudge things, that collectively is enough to actually take us from what's apparently an unsustainable path to a sustainable path. And that's that's kind of our mission building as well. How do we just nudge the world on that narrow path, but that path that does exist, in which is we would put it both people and planet inside. Well, that does sound very hopeful. And Doug, thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. It's been a real pleasure to chat with you on this Global 20 interview. The engagement with corporates has been fascinating, and obviously they have a major role to play in the future, but also very interesting to hear more of the detail and the breadth of the work of the Natural History Museum. So thank you very much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure chatting to you. Thank you. Ian, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure.